Are you looking to get your feet wet in Gen AI on your own terms? Check out our free digital course, Build Your Own Custom GPT by Hatchworks. In the course, we teach you step-by-step -step how to create your own custom GPT so you can start solving some specific problems and use cases in your business with Gen AI. Trust me, you're gonna wow your coworkers and probably even yourself with this new skill. Check out the link in the show notes or visit hatchworks.com to get started. Welcome to Built Right, a podcast by Hatchworks where we help you learn to build the right digital product the right way. In each episode, we'll deconstruct the layers of successful product development, break down popular trends, and offer real advice to help make sure your product is built right. We may not have all the answers, but we've built a lot of digital products across a lot of industries, and we've seen a thing or two. Let's get into it. Today, we're chatting with Arta Bullet, co-founder and CTO of HockeyStack. And HockeyStack is a SaaS analytics and attribution platform that unites website CRM ad data so that marketing and growth teams can actually measure marketing's ROI, know where to invest more, and see account-based intent signals. And y'all have been experiencing substantial growth as of late, attracting notable customers like Airmeet, Lavender, Cognizant, to name a few. And I'm pumped to get into this story of Hockey Stack today. So it's a story of multiple pivots on their journey to product market fit, the, the holy grail of product market fit. So many great learnings for product and engineering leaders in this episode, including some insights towards the end you're not gonna wanna miss with Arda and what he's learned on his journey of building Hockey Stack. But welcome to the show, Arda. Hey, how are you? I'm so excited to be here as well. <clears throat> yeah, excited to get into it. Uh, Hockey Stack's doing some awesome stuff right now. In uh, you know, Hockey Stack, I've been following you all as of late, and it's such a great example of a product that's built right. And the way we kind of think about thanks, that, you thanks. gotta you got to build the right thing, right? That's valuable for your end user, viable for the business, feasible from a technological perspective. And then you got to build it the right way, which is a lot into your wheelhouse on the CTO side in terms of being maintainable, scalable, secure, and usable. And the problem that you're solving is a big one, especially now in you know, recession, hyper attention on budget. I know I'm feeling that and it's, uh, you're going after a major problem in the market. But to start though, I want you to take us back to the beginning. You know, you, when you started, it was kind of the height of the pandemic. Y'all had an initial vision of what you wanted to build, which is actually different than where Hockey Stack is today. But take us through that first part of your journey. I mean, you had a great description there, but you know what they say? It hasn't always been like this. <clears throat> the first year, especially, like it wasn't easy. Uh, as you said, there there has been a couple of pivots, and like uh, the first product, even though it was like always an analytics product wasn't anything like this when we started uh, it was like at the height of the pandemic and like we were trying to do other projects and one of the key things that we noticed there was we can't really like measure product usage and like we tried to mix panel amplitude those kind of classic product analytics tools and like maybe it was our fault but we couldn't really get them to work we couldn't really set like uh, set them up easily so the initial, like the very, very first idea that we had was actually building a product analytics tool that focused on ease of use, that focused on actually like giving insights automatically so that you won't have to look at anything yourself. Uh, we want to use artificial intelligence, which was like, it's weird. It was always like uh, at the height of AI as well then. It's also like, it's also trending right now as well. That's a new height, right? That you're, we're going into a generative AI, right? But it's interesting going back to that point, you mentioned you built an analytics tool with the focus on ease of use. I think this gets into part of the learning. It, like nowhere in that statement did, did I hear like the target customer or the problem you were going after, but maybe, maybe go deeper there on that initial kind of thing you were building and where, where you hit some roadblocks. Yeah, I guess like you also had a great point there from the beginning. Uh, one of the key things that we want to do was build a product that was easy. That was like from the setup perspective, from the usability, it had to be like intuitive uh, for whoever we were selling to. 
the AI was just a way to for way for us to just say that there's gonna be some magic there that's gonna give you the numbers easily so that you won't even have to like analyze the data yourself. But like the <clears throat> the actual first product that I mentioned now, we tried working on it for uh, about five to six months. We were talking with people, like the usual talk with uh, your uh, customers, talk with like uh, people, potential buyers, etc. We thought we were talking with them. We were getting all these like great feedback. Oh, that's a cool product. That's a cool idea. You should do that or something. But as we were building, one thing we noticed was no one really wanted to like put the script on their website to actually like, track the data. <clears throat> no one wanted to share their like current data stack with us. So even though they were saying like cool product, etc., it didn't really mean much when you had to like talk business with them. No one gave any money to this product. Yeah. That, that's a key piece too, right? Is that this concept of, you know, you can get customer feedback and they may say how awesome it is, but when push comes to shove, when it comes, like you mentioned, putting the, with your tool, it's putting a script on their website or actually paying for the solution. You know, if you're not getting those positive signals, it, it may not be actually good enough to replace status quo of how they do it today, right? Exactly. I mean, <clears throat> the actual validation comes when people use the product, not when they say that they can use it or that it sounds interesting or something. That was the first key learning. We tried to get that to work, as I said, for like five to six months or something. But at the end, like we realized it, it, it wasn't going anywhere. Like plus uh, us three, like uh, we didn't have any LinkedIn presence or something back then. So it was like three unknown people. Uh, coming from Turkey, like, uh, how are you going to trust that, basically? Mm -hmm. So after that, like, we realized we had to change something about the product. Like, we... So let me let me pause there, actually. So you're, you're in Turkey. It's you and your other two founders. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you're at this inflection point, right? And so many folks, when they get to this point, they kind of scrap it and go find a, a day job, right? So... You know, yeah. where you're kind of like, what, maybe early 2021 at this point, and you're at this inflection point of, do we keep going? Yeah. Yeah. And what was the, the, what was the trigger for y'all to keep going? Was there, was, was it somebody in the founding team that's like, all right, we, we're going to keep doing this. Did you have an insight that kind of led you to go down another angle? What, what, what pushed you to keep building? Yeah. I think it was just blind faith, you know, like <laughs> sometimes the, you need that, right? Like sometimes, yeah. I mean, we weren't sure if it was going to work. We weren't sure like if we were actually tackling the, the right problem, the right audience, whatever, but we just want to build something and we liked working together. So it was just like a matter of, okay, what are we going to do? Like, what are we going to build actually? So it never even like crossed our minds to at that stage, especially like, uh, find another job. It was more about like, what are we going to do? Like, I remember we had some notion docs where we were doing like pros and cons list of each idea that we have, like what's working, what's working here, what doesn't work there. And we had like some very like uh, terrible arguments around that time on like uh, everyone wants to go in some different direction. But during that stage, one of the ideas that we had was uh, a web analytics tool. Like instead of focusing on product analytics and saying that we use AI or something, we realized that no one really cared about like the technology that you're using as long as you are providing some value to them. So around that time, we tried like uh, focusing on a web analytics tool that's kind of like a competitor to Google Analytics. You can think of this as the second iteration of the product. The idea there was basically like tracking uh, the same way that we were tracking like the product analytics part, but for web analytics and all actually like showing people the journeys of all the visitors that they had, giving them like easier to understand dashboards rather than going to like Google Analytics and like going through all their like complex uh, data visualization methods. That was the second idea. Like uh, around that time, there were a lot of simple web analytics tools, like privacy friendly tools that were coming out as well. So like we kind of rode their wave along with them at that point. And like uh, one of the key things that we did around that time was actually uh, applying to like a website called AppSumo. It's like a lifetime deal platform. Have you heard of it? 
Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We applied there, and like it was, I think, like Emir actually applied there, but he didn't really think much of it. He just like filled out an application and forgot about it, and we just left the product there to like uh, kind of chill on its own for a while. And then after like a month or so, like as we were still like uh, deciding on what we were gonna do next, we realized that there were like a little traction there that maybe like means something. So you had, you didn't even realize it was getting traction. It just it was kind of yeah. something you had did. That's that's what I love about so many journeys and stories. It's kind of these random serendipitous moments that happen. So so you started to get traction. Um, which, you know, gave you another kind of nugget of insight of, okay, there may be something here, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think around that time, like it's made about one, one K, like $1,000 on its own. We thought us doing anything there. We, we saw that, like we saw, okay, maybe there's something here. So we, like we decided to invest more in the AppSumo channel. There are like some Facebook groups or uh, other like communities that they have for the buyers there. So basically we just like, try to be more active, like, like talk with the customers around there. And as people trusted us more, like we tried to actually gain some traction from the AppSumo part with this like easy to use website analytics tool. This is before like any attribution, before B2B SaaS, any of the current things that we are working on right now. So who is your target customer at this point? Uh, or did you really have a target you were going after? At that point, we didn't even choose a target audience. It was whatever AppSumo basically like showed us. Uh, mostly agencies and e-commerce people though, like uh, their audiences, uh, usually those people like the Facebook groups are full of them. But yeah, like we started gaining some traction there. Like people really liked the product. Uh, I think one of the key things there was uh, playing the underdog against like a big uh, tool like Google Analytics, because like <clears throat> when you become that big, there are gonna be a lot of people that don't like it. There are gonna be a lot of people that like really hate it. That's also like uh, one of the things all of those simple web analytics tools kind of use. And we kind of tried to use it as well, like the alternative to Google Analytics, like the analytics that you'll actually wanna use. That was the messaging around that time. People got behind that, like they were sick of Google Analytics. <clears throat> we also like tried to fight with session recording and heat map tools a little bit as well. That was like a time where we were trying to position us based on like other tools. That kind of works for a while, like if you're going for that kind of a why, but I think in the long run, it wasn't going to really work out because like at some point you have to change your messaging so that your product is at the focus of it instead of some other product. Like if you have, I think if you have like another tool in your header, in your website, in like in your main page, I think that's going to be a problem later on that you should probably like uh, think about, but it's worked for a while. Like, uh, the money from the money we made from AppSumo is like probably the pre pre seed round that we did there, like uh, just from the buyers, uh, just from the cause that they bought there that really helped us going for at least like another year or so. That money alone. So, so at this point, you're kind of, you know, you're at this next inflection point. You're starting to get some positive signals. You actually have got some kind of revenue coming in. You yeah. mentioned like these agencies are kind of interested, but you still haven't gotten to like, you know, click. This is it. I, we've got product market fit. What's that next inflection point that got you? I think this is where you actually start to get to what Hockey Stack is today. Yeah. What was that next inflection point? Yeah, basically, <clears throat> like we got the money from AppSumo, we were kind of doing good, but the problem this time was like the customers and the features that they were requesting wasn't really aligning with the vision that we had for the website analytics tool leader. They were asking for like white labeling features. They want to basically show, like use our product, show it as their own to their own customers, especially like the agencies. And we really didn't want to go down that road. You know, you your product then wouldn't have like any brand or something. We, as a SaaS ourselves, like we kind of felt closer to other SaaS businesses, but we didn't really have a way to like validate the idea to actually focus on that. So around that time, like the second pivot that we were about to make was more about like an audience problem rather than like the actual product, because we were kind of like happy with the product. 
uh, it was usable, like people were getting value out of it. So we didn't really think about like the product aspect that much around the pivot. So what we did there to actually like uh, decide on what we we're going to do next, how we we're going to like uh, execute that is talk again with a lot of people. But it isn't just like talking about some abstract concept or like a problem that they might be having that they just say to you like in a call. We actually had something to show to them, like the actual product. And we could ask them like, this is the product. This is how can you use it? Would you use this? Like, how does, how do you think this works? Like, uh, fits in your workflow? That was like the big question that we were asking around that time. And like, we tried that with e-commerce people. We tried that with agencies <clears throat> and we also tried that with SaaS people. And what we realized that SaaS people were generally a lot more responsive to our messages. They were like, they really wanted to like, uh, help us out as well. And they were also interested in the product, but. The key thing is most of the people that we talked to weren't interested in like 90% of the product. Like I remember one person just said like, I'm not going to use this. I'm not going to use that feature. I'm not going to use this page. All I want is this specific thing. And that specific thing that they wanted to see was actually attributing revenue back to blog posts. That was like the big insight that we had. Yeah. And I, I love that too, because you know, some people may hear that, that, oh, I'm not going to use 90% of your product. And they walk away with their tail between their legs. But what that customer just gave you is like the biggest insight of all. Like, here's the gold. This 10% right here is what I care about. And not only what I care about, it's what I would pay for. Props to y'all for actually now focusing in on that area. So now you've started to understand who's that core customer. Uh, that kind of B2B SaaS marketing person looking for attribution and you're getting to what is their job to be done, which is beautiful. And now you're starting to, you, you've you've gotten to what's that core problem that needs to be solved, right? At this point. Yeah. At that point, like we started the messaging with the same thing that they told us, like attributing revenue back to blog posts. And the fun thing is like around that time, we didn't even know that much about attribution. Like it was just a, like, a funny word that we heard about. We didn't even like have that functionality in the product. It was just like a precursor to that. So just that weekend, me and like Bura just hacked away, built like that, the very, very first attribution feature onto the product and tried showing that to be to be SaaS businesses. And like with that, with actually like being able to show that they were a lot more like open to their problems. We could really talk about like the core problems that you mentioned that they were having. And we realized that it isn't just about like a uh, blog post or like revenue either. It's about actually unifying the data that they were getting with the rest of like the tech stack that the company is using. Because without that, like the, I think someone else just said that like they were every month, they were praying that the blog post that they were like uh, publishing would like uh, have some kind of uh, traffic, some, some kind of visitors, because otherwise like they had nothing to show to like execs, to see suit, whatever. They were just like praying to like get that success and they had no way to like measure it. They had no way to optimize it. Yeah. When the alternative is uh, praying for success, then yeah, yeah, you, you got a good, um, <laughs> if you can, if you can solve against that, then you got an opportunity space there. That's such an awesome story. Uh, I'm curious that you, you're the CTO of, of this product and I'm assuming it's built on a really modern stack being a new solution, but I'm seeing like every week, like new features, new functionality being built. So like, what do you attribute that to y'all's ability to quickly iterate, uh, and, and build and deliver, not only build the new features, but actually deliver and put them into production in you know, kind of a safe and secure way. Yeah, I think. It's about like the mindset because even two years ago, when we first started deciding on the tech, like the tech, actual tech stack was just about, okay, which technologies do we know? Which are the technologies that we can actually like uh, push uh, some code, to some production server and like, what's the fastest way to build the MVP? Basically, that's what me and like Bora at first thought about. And that's how we like built the first iteration of the product that like some parts of that code is still being used in production right now. But like from then on, it was about always uh, choosing the simplest 
simplest tax stack that you can have for that stage of the company so that you can quickly find something to show to people. And like even now, while we are like pushing features, it's about making like finding the simplest way to actually like build that feature and then push that and iterate over it over time to actually make it like the complex thing that it is now. I think like Basecamp had a great example uh, about this, like while building their calendar feature, they didn't just go out and build like this complex calendar, but instead they tried to understand the core problem that people were having and then build feature around that core problem instead of just saying like, okay, we should build a calendar or something. In our case as well, like we don't just go out and build the most complex thing and like see if that works for the people. We try to like iterate over the process to make sure like the first version works. Second version, not that well, maybe we improve it at the third version. So that way, like we'll have something to show to people every week. Every week, there's something like new happening in the platform. Now, I was just going to say, you're speaking my language. Basecamp is <laughs> such a good example and use case yeah. of how to do this, right? And like you said, it's it's quickly iterating and not being afraid to put something out there so people can react to and you can continue to iterate on, right? Yeah, exactly. Like we have some features that not a lot of people use. Sometimes we remove features from the product that we know that no one's using. Mm. So like that's that also happens, but you, you should invest like uh, from the start, try to invest less than you would normally do. So like when you have to actually like build, like remove it from the product, it will be such a big loss at the end there. Yeah. That's kind of like the big thing there. And that's such a good nugget too. It's the, like everybody's always in the mindset of build more, build more features, put them out there. But what you just mentioned was critical. It was actually, you know, if a feature is not being used, if it's not adding value, remove it. Because at the end of the day, like you're only creating more complexity in the solution for your user. I, I like to think of it as you're, you're forcing your users to burn more like brain calories right? with the more stuff you have out there. So I love that approach. Even early on, y'all are taking stuff out if it's not adding value to keep it lean and very focused on the problem it solves, right? Exactly. I mean, the simplest example for that is like in the sidebar, for example, we really think about how many things you have in the sidebar and like how much pages that you have. Just the other day, like we had to remove one feature, like a complete feature from the sidebar because like we know no one's using it right now. It isn't like the key thing in the product right now. So you have to like sometimes do those kind of sacrifices to actually make the product more intuitive. Like it comes back to like the ease of use as well. Like if it's less complex, then people are like more likely to use it more. Yeah, that's a great segue. And that's a big piece of like what we think about is built right is, is the product usable? And it's more than just the UI, it's the actual user experience. And one thing I love about Hockey Stack is y'all don't just think about it in the span of I'm a customer, I'm in the solution. You take it further than that. And I see this with the interactive demo that people can use online. And I know that's an engineering effort to do that. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, how quickly you can get it set up. I think y'all you know, talk about you can get set up in two minutes. Talk about that and how you think about the importance of ease of use yeah. in the product experience. I mean, the thing there is that there's always going to be some effort to actually set these and use these tools, but it depends on whether you are putting the effort on the customer side or the developer side. And like as much as possible, we try to put it on our side, like put the weight on our shoulders so that for the customer, everything looks automated. Everything looks like very easy to set up. That means that we have to do a lot of con like configuration out of like generalization on our side because we integrate with a lot of tools we get a lot of data from like uh, from these customers and they have different configurations of these tools we don't ask them to actually like provide us with uh, all these information about their configuration like they don't have to fill all these forms to actually con like integrate at all for them it's just one click but for us it's actually like uh, making sure in the background that everything works according to like the generalized like uh, model that we have for our data. So it's like, it's about who is it going to be hard for either you or the customer. And I will always prefer for it to be hard for myself rather than the customer. Yeah. I'm stealing that. I love that concept of putting the weight on your shoulders and not your customers. That's, that's such a great way to think about it because it really, you have that trade-off, right? It can be on your customer's shoulders or it can be on yours. 
Uh, and one thing I heard you mention, like a big part of your uh, product, your solution are the integrations and making that easy. How do you go about prioritizing and determining which integrations to add to the platform? Like, Do you have any kind of criteria you go through when you're saying, let's prioritize this integration first over this integration within the solution? Yeah, that's a great question. And like, it has a very simple answer. Whatever we do, it's things that people like, it's things that our customers ask us. It's things that we hear in the demos. So like the, the simple metric that we use is like, okay, who is asking for this? How many people are asking for this feature? Like if we have just one person asking for integration, we still put that in the roadmap, but like a little bit lower than the other things. And if we get like a lot more people saying that we use this tool as well, if they like kind of mention that, that thing like that task kind of gets prioritized more and more until it's like in the cycle for this week, in the cycle for next week. So it's like very, very simple, but it works. Like for the last couple of months, at least, we aren't building anything that our customers aren't asking for us. So many good insights here. And that that's the thing. Like so many people, I think, overcomplicate this. What you just said is, does the customer need it? Have we heard them ask for it? And the big piece there is you're actually continuing talking to customers, listening to customers, which a lot of people overlook. A lot of the times people talk to users and customers at the beginning, but don't do it throughout. And you, you make it easy in that way because it's not some complex formula or prioritization framework. It's no, customers have told us they want this, they need this. So we prioritize it in that way. Uh, yeah, to, to wrap it up, I got one more question for you. Uh, you know, CTO of Hockey Stack, y'all are growing. Y'all are, you know, we were just chatting before this. You're living it up in San Francisco now, uh, mingling with all the folks there. But what's the the biggest thing you've learned? Like, if you could go back to your former self at the beginning of this, what's that one piece of advice that you would give your former self or another young, you know, CTO or engineering leader uh, about building a, a solution that can scale and grow? Uh, good question. I would say the biggest thing while building a product with limited resources is like the last thing we talked about, actually prioritization. So like you have, it's like a very simple problem. You have about, I don't know, eight to 10 hours that like you can potentially work in a day. And like most of the day, like, even though you think that you are prioritizing the same things, if you actually like Drill, like drill down and actually see what you are doing at each hour. Usually there are going to be things that don't really matter that much, but you still do because you think that they matter because you didn't like criti critically think about those stuff. But if you can actually prioritize your day as well as like prioritize the features, you can actually like have a lot more impact. I'm like a big believer in the 80 to, eight to 20 rule where like most of the things is going to come from that 20% of the work that you are doing. The other 80% is just manual things that you can probably like uh, automate or like just don't do at all. So if you can actually crack the code, if you can actually always try to optimize the process that way, you'll be able to move a lot faster. And a lot of people are going to think like, how are they actually building off this so fast? But in fact, you are just focusing on that like key part, key 20%. That's giving, like, that's creating the illusion of that you're doing, like, everything at the same. Yeah. Yeah. Such a foundational lesson there. And it's broader than just like for, for engineering a solution that, that applies yeah. to life and everything. And going back to that, that customer you talk to, sometimes it's that 10% of the <laughs> solution they care about. Yeah. Right. Uh, but that's awesome. But Arda, I, I appreciate the chat. It's been great having <laughs> you on Built Right. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Built Right. If you enjoy the show, give us a follow or subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to leave us a review. For more info on Built Right, visit us at hatchworksbuiltright.com. Big news. Season two of the Built Right podcast is right around the corner, launching on February 6th. And in this season, we're going all in on generative AI. 
The guest list is insane, ranging from international AI speakers, founders of Gen AI products, experts in specific domains of Gen AI, and leaders across industries. And we'll even have some Hatrick's own Gen AI leaders as we dig into our generative driven development methodology. This season isn't just for non techies, though. Whether you're an AI guru or just AI curious, we're going to bring tactical real world applications of how you can apply Gen AI in your work and your life that anyone can understand and relate to. And P.S. Gen AI will impact every single industry. So no matter your domain, you need to make sure you set a reminder every other week to listen to the next episode of the Built Right Podcast. While you're waiting for season two, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss an episode. And give us a follow on LinkedIn to join the conversation and give us ideas on specific Gen AI topics you want to hear about. So get ready. Built Right Season 2 Gen AI Edition is coming your way.